And welcome to another session of the Teachers Room with ITDI, the International Teacher Development Institute. We're here every couple of weeks in different forms and different locations. And tonight we're very pleased to have Catherine Billsborough. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Stephen. Great to be here. Oh, thank you so much. And we'll see people popping in and out throughout the whole session. Um, and we're recording, as we've just said. So everybody, feel free. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see a little uh, speech bubble that says chat. If you click on the chat button, then you'll be in here with the rest of us and able to throw in some questions. Um, basically, the format is a, is a bit of a free-for-all, but um, I have a whole bunch of things planned, and we'll just talk with Catherine. And uh, Catherine, there's no limit to as long as you want to talk. I'm going to interrupt you sometimes when I have burning follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. And we'll just uh, enjoy the next uh, hour together and see where it takes us. So as I said, people pop in. If you're uh, not getting any love on the chat and you want to just jump in and fire off a question, we'll accept that as well. So here we go. Um, Catherine. Take us back to the beginning. Were, were you born uh, uh, an ELT uh, writer or how, when you came out, how did you uh, get from there to here? Um, it's a really good question actually, because I don't think, I don't know a single ELT writer who actually plans to, to be an ELT writer. Right, Although right. I, I, I do have to say that um, I always wanted to be a writer of some kind. From back then. So I think I, I started being an ELT writer in a way that lots of my colleagues who are doing the same thing, um, uh, they began in the same way. Basically um, creating materials for my own classes and coming to a realization that that was part of the job that I really enjoyed doing. Um, one of the most, uh, my, mo my most favorite parts of the job. And I used to, well, in the old days, um, it was very much uh, pen and paper and felt pens and cutting and sticking. And yeah. uh, I'm sure well, some take, of the take people- us, Take us one step before that. How did you actually get into the classroom? Did you ever think, I mean, I didn't expect to be a teacher and, I've, I've really been highlighting my own students who look like they could be good teachers because nobody ever told me I should consider it. And I, I regretted that. Yeah. Um, I never planned to be a teacher. <laughs> never planned. Um, I, the last job I had that wasn't teaching, uh, before I started teaching, I was working in uh, the Charles Dickens Museum in the UK. Uh, as a research assistant um, and I loved my job it was very very interesting and I'd previously done all kinds of other jobs um, and then I met my my boyfriend who became my husband um, and we got married and we decided that we wanted to live in another country <coughs> and doing a, a, a TEFL prep certificate was a good way to get some kind of a qualification so that we could go somewhere and find a job. Right. So we, we did, we did that. We did that. And you were in the UK off. at this point before you left. Yeah, we were in the UK. And so in 1987, we, we did that uh, certificate and we left and we went to live in Spain <laughs> in Madrid and we've remained here ever since. Um, and wow. then we obviously got different jobs, got better jobs, did more training, more got better qualifications, more experience. Moved from Madrid to the north of Spain, to the Basque Country, where I lived for many years. And about five or six years ago, I moved again to still in the north of Spain, but to a very quiet little village up in the mountains. Um, and when I say it's small, people often don't realize quite how small, but we've got 11 inhabitants in our village. So it really is small. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's the definition of small. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. When I go to places where there are like 200 inhabitants, I get a bit dizzy. It all seems a bit too hectic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Was Spain, as, was Spain an obvious choice for the two of you back in 1987? Um, surprisingly for two British people, Spain was one of the few places where neither of us had lived or been before. So we wanted to go to a place that was new for the both of us. Um, and it seemed like a good choice. We knew a few people there. There were jobs teaching English that were advertised in the, in the British press. So we were able to find the job before we, we left home. Um, so it, it was partly accidental. We didn't really think about it a great deal. Um, but I think Spain had an appeal too because it seemed like a, a, good, a good place to live, an easy place to live. Right. And, right. and that proved true. It's a very so, easy place to live. In your, in your early teaching days, were you, uh, like I was, teaching um, from kids to businessmen to housewives and students and sort of the whole yeah. range of things? Yeah. yeah. Well, my first yeah. job, um, I was pregnant when I first arrived in Spain oh. and, and then had a small baby and then another baby and so I had to find work that fit around uh, my husband's timetable and, and the children. And I, the best thing for that was to teach private classes. So my first work basically were private classes. And exactly as you say, so maybe seven o'clock in the morning, I'd have a class with some businessmen and women. Uh, and then maybe lunchtime, I'd be teaching some children in their break time from school. And then in the evenings, maybe some older children, it, really everything. Yeah. And, and so I was forced to make materials, really, because I couldn't possibly afford to buy books and materials for all of those different levels. We right. had very little money. Books were very expensive, and there weren't that many materials at that time, actually. So I used to be make things, um, and as I said before, just enjoy that side of it. We, I'm sure lots of people listening will, will remember getting an interest in newspaper um, article and making a gap fill or something. Yeah. You know, with that the, with the whiteout. Tippex, tip exactly, yeah, that, that kind of thing, stick in and... So yeah, that's, and then I got a job um, in a, a state school and I was teaching four-year-olds for one year. That was exhausting, but yes. a real, real change. Um, and then I got a job in a language school um, mm -hmm. and then we moved and I got a job in another language school, etc. So about how many years were you piecing together all of this uh, wide range of teaching experiences? Um, probably for, well, I started in 1987. I mean, I think I'm still piecing it together. Right. So, <laughs> so it's 32 years already. But um, obviously you, you start to find areas where you are more comfortable. Um, I started, and I started teacher training when I'd been working teaching for about... <laughs> maybe 15 years yeah um, that was a whole new ball game and a revelation it was so rewarding um i loved i loved and loved teacher training yeah uh, and i also did a lot of exam preparation classes i i kind of found a little something i was good at there with you know cambridge official exams etc so um i think when you start doing things and you find out what you're good at, you tend to do more and more of that. And yes. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So it seems like we've got this, uh, the teacher side of you, the materials writer side of you and the teacher trainer side of you. Um, can you rank them in terms of love? Uh, yeah. The thing is, I really. And it could change. I mean, it changes over the years, but. I think that I think that you can't do one without the other. I think that yeah. they necessarily need to happen. Maybe not exactly at the same time, but I don't think I don't think you can write materials without having taught. Um, 
I mainly write materials for primary and that's where most of my experience probably is. Um, I think that when you write materials for the classroom, you write, you've always got the end users in mind. And that is not just the students, that's the teachers too. So the whole idea of teacher training comes into play there. So mm -hmm. I think that as I'm writing, I'm thinking, what would I do at this moment in the classroom? How might my students react? What, why would teachers like this? Or would they prefer mm -hmm. something? This kind of thing. Um, because I work mainly now in, in isolation, as, as if you like, it, it, you know, like I don't, I've, I ha I'm not in a staff room usually. I'm at right. home at my desk in the middle of nowhere. So when I have an opportunity to actually connect with other teachers and go physically to do some workshops or online training mm. or um, maybe a couple of classes so that I can try out materials, that's a real um, joy for me. Mm. I mm. love it. Yeah. Maybe if, if I thought it was going to be every single day, it, it wouldn't be as appealing because, right. but because I know it's going to be a week or a yeah. month or a day. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, really nice. Did the, um, did the market dictate that you started writing materials for young learners or was that a choice? Um, I think what happened was that um, you can't really choose what you're going to do. You know, opportunities come up and you take them or you don't. So I, the first writing, the first thing I ever got paid to write was for primary and it was a poster pack. For, for Oxford University Press. Mm. And basically it was a poster which I designed and somebody else then illustrated and made. Yep. And my part of it was the, the pack, if you like. So all the worksheets that went, went with the poster to practice different language and for different levels, etc. That was the very first thing. And that happens to be primary. Um, and the first course book, I wrote was also primary and that came about because I went um, I did a teacher trainer uh, I did a talk for teachers at a conference in Spain and the talk was a, it was a workshop and it was about how to use games to teach uh, structures language yeah and there happened to be a commission and editor in that uh, at that event in in that workshop and at the end of it she came up to me and she said would you be interested in writing our new primary course which was really yeah. um, which was amazing and I think the message there is for teachers that if you you know it, get out there and do things and don't think that you've got nothing to share because at the time I felt I was reluctant to give this workshop because right. I felt I felt that you know other people knew far more than me and I didn't really have anything to say but my my manager actually said no Kath go and do it because you've got some good ideas and you know even if you try it if you like so that was um yeah, it, it well, was like that's, that's that's pretty high on the validation. <laughs> yeah, level, hey? somebody yeah. coming up to you afterwards and saying, "Hey, I like that. Would you write a, a series?" Yeah, wow. yeah. So that was, and then after that, once when you've written one book, I think when you write one course book or not on or something uh, bigish, if you like. Um, that's the moment when you decide whether you're going to carry on doing that or whether you that's it you've tried it you and you're not going to do it anymore for whatever reason yeah. and it works both ways i think because from a publisher's point of view if you've managed to write a course book probably you've what you've done is you've shown them that you can follow a brief you can keep to deadlines um you can basically do what <laughs> what you told because it's not always, um, I did what I was told because what I was told to do made sense. Yeah. And I really felt that I, I, there was a lot of expertise behind the whole project. So mm -hmm. it wasn't an issue. But sometimes we come across things where we feel we might actually know better. Not because mm -hmm. we're being big-headed or anything, but because right. maybe 
the publishers are inexperienced in a certain area and and you know that can cause a little bit of friction sometimes yeah 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 um i'm i'm uh, editing inside my head right now because i had the exact thing happen today i was looking at uh, a lesson that i was asked to look at by a publisher and for the first time i wrote back and said I really don't like this lesson. <laughs> and, and then I got a big thank you from them saying, we were wondering the same thing, you know, but yeah. it, took, it took a number of years working with them to get the courage to, to just say something so direct to them. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's very complicated yes. because of the, you've got individuals, you've got experiences, you've got different outlooks, different different contexts um, and what might seem very important to one person is unimportant to somebody else or yeah. sometimes you don't know the reasons too. So for example, you might have an editor say, you can't do this or you can't right. have this. Um, and if they don't explain, you probably, if you're like me, you'll start thinking it's all to do with you and it's you wondering what you've done wrong. And, right. and then when you come around to asking, they'll say, oh, no, nothing as sinister as that. We've simply got something very, very similar in a lower level. Yeah. You know, this kind of thing. So I think clarity is always good dialogues. And good communication. <laughs> eh? Exactly. Yeah. And that's the same for everything, I think, in, yeah. in life, life in general. Yeah. Um, you need to, I'm much better now um, at explaining what I think or not taking anything for granted, you know, right. just making sure you spell things out yeah. and cho choosing your battles, as we yes. say in business. So exactly. sometimes they might say, can you change this from this to this? And there might be no seemingly obvious reason for it but if it's something that's not that important you just say okay and do right. it right whereas if it's something that you feel very strongly about maybe then you need to argue your reasons and you might win or you might lose but yeah if, if you argue every point um you'll end up getting stressed exhausted and you know thrown not, away um, onto the trash heap of yeah. yeah here in japan um, we have a lot of people that uh, go in and claim it's my language <laughs> you know and they're sitting yeah. around the table with 10 10 high school and university professors who are japanese and i've just heard stories like this over and over and yeah you have to have some basic common sense i guess um, i think so and i think you, you just need to there's an expression in spanish which is um, probably exists in other languages and in Spanish they, we say hablando se entiende la gente and it just means people and only understand each other when you start speaking you, mm. you can't read minds you can't you know even written words sometimes you know you don't get that right right you know, so, well, yeah. I, I don't want to put you on the spot but I want to ask you to just give us a run through of how much uh, you've published, like what kinds of things from that first poster pad to, to now? Um, okay, so I've written more than 30 course books. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a lot. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I've written um, online courses as well. So um, I usually, my most recent work has been primary course books um, for Oxford University Press and my most recent book was for National Geographic Learning. Mm. They've got a new book that's just come out. So um, the work I do online, online courses, that's usually been um, for teenagers and for adults. Yeah. I've, I've done quite a few courses for the British Council and the BBC Learning English for English for specific purposes. So um, English for taxi drivers, English for the for police officers. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Which it, it's actually great fun. I think what I really like about my work more than anything, the one thing I suppose that I love 
is that variety. Yeah. So I might be writing a story for a five-year-old on Monday morning, and then I write, might be writing something as, as obscure as a, you know, um, a functions-based course for taxi drivers right. later in the afternoon. So <laughs> it, it's, it's good. That's good. It's, it's, and, and, it's good only, and only 11 people around you to tell all about this face-to-face. -face, yeah, yeah. That's why when I actually do end up in a place where there are friends and colleagues, if I go to a conference or meet yep. up with some friends, I just, I, I, I end up, the, well, I end up at the end of the week with no voice, probably right. because I've just been talking, yeah. talking, talking. And, yeah. you know. um, I'm wondering if some teachers watching this might wonder, hey, I'm working with this um, little publisher doing this little project, maybe other publishers won't want to work with me. Is there anything you can speak to in terms, you've mentioned Oxford University Press, National Geographic, and you know, well, how, how do you? I think that, I think um, the opposite is true. No. I think, I think, because I really think that when a, when a publisher um, or when a writer or a would-be writer applies for a job, if you like, or to take part, to join in a project with a, with a well-known publisher, that publisher needs to know that you can write. Mm. And sometimes, usually, almost always, they'll ask you to do um, a sample, a sample unit or something. But if you've actually got something that you've written for another publisher, no matter how small or even not for a publisher, even like self-published or something that you've put online or in a blog post or lesson plans that you might have created for your context at school. If you've got something like that that you can show that publisher, mm. then you've got a head start. But I would say that if it is something that you've done yourself, always make sure that it's the very best that you've done. So get it proofread. Make sure that, you know, don't just rely on your own um, two yeah. eyes. Make right. sure that somebody checks through it to spot any typos even or anything. Right. But yes, yeah, if you've got something, I think people who would like to get into working as writers, um, as a profession, they need to, or a good thing to do is to show their work. And that can be done in a number of ways. Um, blog posts, as I've said, or getting in touch with um, websites and publishers sites where they actually publish uh, materials from lots of teachers, the British right. Council, Macmillan. I mean, yeah, everybody's Scotland. looking for content these days, aren't they? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and sometimes um, you might get paid for this kind of work. Mm. So if you write a lesson plan for a publisher for their website, they might pay you. Sometimes you might need to accept that you won't get paid for something. Yeah. Um, but it's worth doing because then you can point them in that direction. You've got something to, to show, you, you know. Yeah. So, so has yeah. your longest, uh, we're going to move on to some other topics, but uh, just to stretch this publisher stuff out just a little longer. It, has OUP, Oxford University Press, been your longest relationship? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and what's the secret? What I'm getting to is in, in two or three points, what's the secret to keeping that long? Obviously, it's a, it's a huge, great publisher to be associated with. What's the secret to um, keeping it going that long? Um, I think it's what I mentioned before, basically. They, I think that they, we've built up mutual trust and respect and um, the books that I've been involved with have done quite well so they're happy with that another thing actually another point to take into account um, is that publishers usually like as an added bonus if not only you're able to write but you can also do a workshop or something like this to promote the materials basically oh. they like this so usually with with my contracts and other writers too we might have in the contract that you'll write a book and then you'll do, you'll speak at three conferences or you'll do a webinar or you'll do some kind of teacher training. So um, most people I know are happy to do that and, and that 
kind of that's a bonus for the publisher because not only do they get an author but they get a teacher trainer and somebody to go out there and be a face for their for their work not only yeah. the book that you've written but for all of their all of their books so how scary was that at the beginning going up and and doing agreeing to do those kinds of things i see we have a comment from peter um yes yeah, his, uh, his all caps <laughs> option <laughs> i um i i always get scared and nervous before yeah. before teacher training giving a workshop um talks People sometimes say to me, why are you nervous? You've done this hundreds of times before. But I don't think it, I, I, I don't think I'll ever stop being nervous about it. So I've accepted that fact that I get nervous. And I think that probably the day I don't feel nervous, maybe that's the day to stop doing it because yeah. I don't care enough anymore. Um, usually I feel extremely nervous. And then as soon as I start doing it, I, that goes and I just forget and and um, I get into it. I enjoy it. I always think that, I mean, I always think, oh, people are going to criticize me. People are going to, there are people out there that know more than me about what I'm talking about. And I think that's true. There'll always be somebody in the audience who will know more about something than you. Yeah. But they're not you. And you are in a unique place, whoever you are and whatever your experiences are. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because most of the people, I think if most people leave a workshop or a conference having learned one thing or one, you know, I know that when I go to workshops, um, even if the person is talking about something I know a lot about, I almost always leave with something new maybe not from the person who's talking maybe from the person sitting next to me when they say you know get into pairs and share an idea about this or whatever so yeah um we're all i don't see it as us and them i really absolutely believe that we're all in this together and there's you know we're all learning from each other so for example when i do a, an online course um which we might talk about later um, the one I did last year and the year before with the ITDI. I cannot begin to tell you how many things I learned on those courses. Even though I was the tutor, nice. it was just illuminating. Things, mm. practical things like tools I'd never heard of or books that were recommended that I'd never heard of. Um, ways of doing things that I'd never considered. Other, other other perspectives on things that I'd never considered. Mm. So, you know, I think that if you, I think that's what I like best about um, teacher training and webinars and anything yep. of this kind is, yep. is what we all get from each other, not the one person up there and everybody else. Right. Yeah. Well, you've, um, I, we, we, I hosted you for the last two, um, um, advanced skills courses that you did creating ELT materials back in 2016 and then last year in 2018. Um, last year was a monster class. We had like 65 teachers from uh, here I got 30, 30 different yeah. countries around the world. And yeah. I wanted to say just before you got into that, the two, two points crashing at the same time is that I, I marveled at how well you did in those sessions and, and I couldn't put my finger on it till just a minute ago and I realized you're wise. You're just a very <laughs> wise woman with, with, with your experience and your perspectives on things and the, the feeling of having all of that positive energy and and you exude like it's okay to trust you. Yeah, it's something about your timing and about your delivery. You know, I never feel like I'm gonna get scolded if I say something, right? Oh, that's no, really you make, nice. You create such a really nice, warm, open atmosphere that I think it just creates uh, a lot of creativity and and openness. Do you think? That's yeah, I mean, that's a really nice thing to say. I think that, um, I think, you know, when you get a group of people together 
who want to learn and what and I've got creative ideas then it's not difficult to create an, an atmosphere of that kind right for me for me it's a real joy to to see the connections being made between participants you know I might not even be involved in so for example and uh, on that course a couple of years ago um the, I noticed that two teachers in different countries uh, were working on and, and had ideas that were very, very similar. Their right. context was very, very similar. One was in Italy, one was in Greece. And they were starting to make create materials. They both had their own academies, their language schools. They were both primary focused. And I suddenly realized this and thought, you two need to be doing this together. And, and obviously, you, you know, you can't force other people to do things together. So I contacted, I contacted them both individually first uh -huh. and asked them, explain this. And they were both up for it. They were both really happy. And I put them together to do something. And, and afterwards, it was just the most wonderful thing because they started a blog post. They started a blog together. Yeah. Neither of them had a blog. Right. Started a blog together. They asked, they invited me to be a, their first blog guest blogger on their <laughs> blog post, which was quite nice. Yeah. Then they actually um, started, they set up a business together. They went off to a conference together in Barcelona. They met in person. Now they're good friends. Their children are friends. They're this kind of thing. They, yeah. And they're doing great things. So, you know, when there's that level of commitment, um, creativity, eagerness to, to just do new things and, and when, when all that already exists, yeah. it's, I just see that my job is just kind of making sure the right people are connected and yeah. everyone's, everyone's got what they need to do what they need to do. But also another message that for me is very important um, to give to people is that you, you must ask for what you want and you must um, you know, don't be afraid to ask. I always say, you know, if you don't ask, you, you don't get. So if you don't, you know, ask that person, would you like to collaborate with me on this project? They might say no, because they might be busy or whatever reason. But if you don't ask, you never know. And usually, in my experience, and not just with myself, but other people um, I've worked with and, and participants on these courses, the responses have been positive and mm. people are out there doing, I mean, that was just one example I gave you. There are loads more where, where that came from. Mm. Uh, and it seems like, um, uh, not to beat this to death, but uh, I've been to a couple of presentations and webinars where the, the speaker had a lot of ego happening. And, uh, and it felt very hard to, to get in there. But uh, it seems like you're describing your role as, as maybe the, the facilitator to a degree of, like you said, putting people together and, and the, the, the orchestra conductor a little more here, a little less there. And, and that's, yeah. a, that's a fun I, position to be in. I think, it's, um, I think there might be a time and place to be, you know, a speaker and have your ego, you yep. know, doing things there. But um, it's not a position that I feel comfortable in at all. Right. Um, my husband keeps my feet very firmly on the ground. He's, <laughs> he's into Tai Chi and a lot of um, sort of Eastern philosophy. And he, he'll say, you know, it's not all about you. Or So I think that... Um, it's much more fulfilling when you are a part of the group rather than, you know, sitting above the group looking yeah. down sort of thing. Yeah. Definitely. So you gave us uh, that, that glorious story of the, the Italian and Greek ladies. Um, uh, looking back just for a moment, do you, do you remember when we first got in touch, maybe it was through Barb, to do the first creating ELT materials course i'm wondering what's left over in your brain from those first couple of experiences which will lead <coughs> into what what are we uh, aiming for in this next course i think what i've um 
At the very beginning, I had no idea how um, organic I, things could go, if you like, how yeah. spontaneous, how... When, when, you, when you write a description for a course and yeah. you put it on the website and participants come and they read that description and they decide whether or not to, to sign up for it, I'm very aware of the fact that we have to stick to that description. But within, I'm also aware, for me, the, the, the nice thing is stick into that description so everything there will be true, but having the opportunity as well to be able to go off script sometimes to yeah. be spontaneous and respond to something that comes out of the group. So, for example, in the first, uh, in the first course, um, I had absolutely no intention. I, I had planned what I, what kind of what discussion I wanted going on in the forum uh, a certain week. Um, let me just let me just explain for the the audience that yeah. we we had these live sessions uh, once a week, usually on a Sunday night, uh, a Sunday night in Japan and and throughout the day in other areas. And then throughout the week, we had an online forum where people would uh, upload their homework assignments and interact with each other throughout the week, right? That's right. Yeah. We had two things going on. So we had the task, um, which was a, a doable task um, with peer reviewing, etc., and me reviewing. And we also had a discussion about a point related to what we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, and I had those prepared, those discussion points. It, that wasn't on the website beforehand, but I right. knew what, what they were going to be. But then um, during one of the, the live uh, sessions, yeah. somebody commented in the chat box something about the fact that um, all audio scripts should be recorded with native speaker voices. I remember that. And I was, I, I, I was watching the chat, but no, not, no. Part, not participating. And some people agreed and some people disagreed. And I thought then that is a really good topic for this week's debate. Partly because this week's discussion, partly yeah. because I wanted to know what people thought um, because this was something that was being spoken about in, in, in general, if you like, yes. in the ELT world at the time. And I knew what my feelings were. That's, I wasn't joining in then because I, I didn't want to sway anyone's yeah. judgment. So I decided to have that as the, the topic. And it was just great because people, people gave their opinion. It became clear that context is everything. And even though most people, I think, most people um, agreed uh, at the end that, that it wasn't true that, you know, we needed to be, they needed to be native speakers, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, but most people started to see other people's points of view. So it d depended very much on, on where you were, the age of the students, etc., etc. And that was just a really nice example of going off script and, and it being quite exciting and quite on a, on a, um, on what's the word? It was, it was. What Not was organic, as you said. Yeah. 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 And it's what, what we were speaking about at the time. It was really fascinating for me to, because what I noticed um, was that the majority of people who said that the speakers should be native were non-native. Yeah. And the majority of the people who said that they should be non-native were native. Yeah, yeah. And that said a lot too. I mean, I don't know what, you know, I, it was just, it just gives you lots of things then to think about and discuss. And yeah. so that, that's another, I mean, I wonder, I wonder what will crop up this time. And yeah, expect. that's the exciting thing. I mean, on the first course, Barb typed earlier, um, saying something like, nobody will believe, but it was your first ever online course, the one you did with us. And we had 46 teachers in that class from 21 different countries. 
And uh, we've, we've run courses with seven teachers, which was <laughs> maybe a little more of, of a niche topic, but still we would ask the teacher, there only seven have signed up, would you like to do it anyway? And most often the teachers do want to do it for the experience and to support the teachers interested. But your first kick at the can, you had 46 people in there. And last year, I said earlier, we had 65 and it almost took on a life of its own, hey? Yeah. And I was I was feeling, I did one of these courses a few years ago and I just was tied to my computer every day answering things and you were juggling 65 people. Um, was it such a blur that, what do you remember of that from last year? It was, it was just crazy. But yeah. what I did um, in terms of organization, I just made sure that I um, went into the forum every day at, at a similar time in the evening to yeah. spend an hour or so commenting and reading, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, it was amazing because I'd go away and have a cup of tea or something, <laughs> and then I'd come back and I'd have about 50 notifications. Yeah. So, um, but, but it, it, other people share the workload, if you like, because yes. the participants' generosity in peer reviewing and reading each other's um, work, if you like, looking at each other's lesson plans, or not lesson plans, the, the materials that they're creating, yeah. is, is overwhelming. So somebody makes maybe a worksheet to use for a specific context in a specific country. They explain the, you know, a little bit about why they're creating it. And then they had 60 odd people looking at it yeah. and saying, and making suggestions yes. and very valid, valid suggestions. Why yes. don't you, you know, make this uh, text shorter and do, you know, make a listening out of the other half or things that I wouldn't, you know, might not occur to me. And right. it was really great. I mean, most of the time I spent online was reading what other people had written Yes. and, and seeing where they were coming from and, um, you know, and making comments to show that, you know, they know I'm listening and maybe somebody would ask, um, how can I do this? And then maybe if I knew how they could do it, I would write that. But if I didn't, I maybe say somewhere, this person is looking for a tool that they can use to do this or that. So yeah. Yeah. we're sharing recommendations. Of yeah. But I remember Barb and, and Phil and I in the background going, oh my God, how is she keeping up with them? <laughs> and the quality of your kind of personalized feedback was excellent, as well as, as Phil's written there, the teacher to teacher feedback. I remember when people were giving suggestions on on everything from colors yeah. and layouts and, and yeah. just, it, it, it reminds me of the... Um, the, the word amateur being for the love of it, that, yeah. that people were really loving what other people were doing and just giving, you know, pure, unfettered feedback. Another thing that you've just reminded me of that I really enjoyed was um, somebody would create some materials um, on a, maybe I remember one woman um, creating some materials on a, a social issue um, mm. and, and, it was so good and so powerful. And then about half a dozen teachers immediately said, can I use that with yes. my class? I remember and that then, too. And then somebody, and then I think I said, you know, make it clear if you're happy for other people to actually go and use these materials, because what you've got there is priceless. What you've got there is an opportunity for piloting your materials with different groups in different countries I'm yep. getting some feedback. So, you know, this is something that I'll probably um, encourage and be and actually not set up in a formal way, but right. say at the beginning of the next course, if you create some materials that you'd like other teachers here to pilot and get give you some feedback, you know, yep. go ahead and go ahead and ask because I never had anyone to do that with the materials no. I was creating uh, when I began creative materials so yeah yeah invaluable do you, think, 
Do you think that this um, this uh, 2019 version of of creating ELT materials um, is it only for people who want to publish something um, professionally or no, no? So no, ab absolutely not. In fact, I would say that I would say that more than half of the participants probably had no intention of uh, becoming a professional writer, maybe in a dream or maybe at the back of their mind or something. I think most people, the people I'm remembering and the people that stick in my mind were people who maybe they had to create their own materials for a university course that they were teaching on where the materials that were uh, best for their students didn't exist. Right. Um, and then they were going to be able to create a set of materials that they could use again and again every year. And um, So are you no. fairly confident people will get some of the, the best practices or the um, underlying principles of good uh, materials design? Yeah, because, I mean, this is something that we talk about in the, in the live sessions, the principles of design, etc. something I'm very... Um, keen on talking about basically I think what, what I feel my role is is to help participants to help teachers with the creation of their materials help them to help to make them as good as they possibly can be the best quality they possibly can be so um, that might mean different things to different people people have different principles and different ideas and they're all acceptable if they fit to that context that they're working in so and also to get people to collaborate and to share materials because if two or three people are doing similar things in on their own in different you know different sides of the world why can't they get together and put these materials in a shared space so that then they've got double the materials and you know this kind of thing that's that's what that's what I, I really like so for me it's nice to identify sometimes to <coughs> um, those people who are creating materials for primary those who work in a um, tertiary education or they might yeah. be you know those who teach in language schools where they might be teaching children in the morning and or exam focused materials yep. so they will be inevitably on the next course as well a real mix of people and I think with the, the for me it's important that the theoretical part is uh, in, in the same for everybody you know yes. it, the basics that's hey, the same the, for everybody. Yeah. but then when they go off and create the materials they'll do their own mm -hmm. thing that will be my idea is that the uh, materials they create during the course are materials that they will be able to use if not the very next day then you know short soon after shortly after so yeah. it's very practical I want it to be practical I suppose what I want to do is create do the kind of course that I would like I'd like to have attended had I been in their shoes if a course had been running like this when I was starting creating materials yeah, yeah, back exactly. in the day I, I think I would have found it quite useful mm. Do you think, um, I'm going to wrap up with this last question, then we'll, we'll leave the last few minutes for any questions from the audience. So everybody get ready. Uh, we're going to be typing questions. In it. But I just wanted to ask if you've been uh, writing materials for, for close to 30 years now, do you think what, what has been the biggest um, uh, growth on your part? Is it your, your confidence now to deal with new projects? Is it your communication skills? Is it your clarity of thinking? Um, it, what, what kinds of things come to mind? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's good to, to reflect on your own development, isn't yeah. it? So confidence is definitely a big one. Not in terms of me feeling able to just do anything, if you like, but in yep. terms of me feeling 
able and willing to have a try and not worry about um, about it going wrong. So, for example, recently this year, I was invited to um, be part of the clothes and plenary at the Ayatefel conference in, in Liverpool. Yeah. That's a good and, one. Yeah. And so they decided to try a new format, but they wanted four speakers and they wanted an author, um, a teacher trainer, a teacher and somebody who was involved with um, English in the workplace. And when they chose me to be the author speaker, I was, I was shocked. I was really shocked. And in, a, I, in a good uh, way. Yeah, in a good way. But I thought, why me? There are, there are lots of people who, who, you know, there are yeah. lots of famous writers <clears throat> who are members of IATEFL, et cetera. And um, one of the organizers told me it was because it, we were talking about the future of English language teaching. So I was talking about materials and they said that basically they, they see me banging on about things, you know, I care about certain things. So that was one of the reasons. But maybe 15 years ago, if I had been asked to do that, which I probably wouldn't have been, I might have said no, right. I might have been too scared of the um the spotlight the, the criticism afterwards maybe yeah, yeah. um but this time i was very nervous before going up um to actually speak but i was i felt like it was a great honor to have been chosen and i felt that i had to use my time wisely and i i really felt passionate about what i was saying mm. and i really did not care whether I was criticized afterwards for what I said, because I felt well, that that's, I, that's maturity for sure. You've matured in the way that you just don't yeah, care what other people are to have their opinions, right? Exactly. And, I, and it's really been good to talk about them because lots of people have contacted me since some most agreeing with things and saying, oh, well, what can we do about this? And some people have said, Oh, I don't think, you know, Mm. I don't agree about this point and yeah. because in my country, whatever, yeah. and, and I accept that. And yeah. it, um, but unless you actually go out there and do this, you know, it's, it's good to sometimes to, I find, my myself, out. I find myself saying yes to most things that, uh, and then thinking afterwards, why did I say yes to that? But right, right. yeah. Wow. What a, what a breeze this has been 54 minutes and yeah. we're, it was easy. It was a lot of fun. Let's, let's open it up if anybody wants to make a comment uh, by turning your microphone on or to um, ask a question, if you like. Well, Peter has just um, written there that he sometimes gets, gets or he dreads getting asked to give workshops. What I would say to Peter, <coughs> what I would ask to, 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 what I would say to Peter would be, one of the best ways to to do a workshop when you feel um, nervous is to do it with somebody else, to do a joint workshop with another person. Um, I actually did a joint workshop a couple of years ago at IATEFL, even though I, I'd done lots of workshops on my own with, with a colleague, and it was the most fun thing to do you've got two people you've got the sh you share you share the nerves I, yep. I mean you know I won't lie about that but you you also share the celebration afterwards when when things inevitably go well and and just always recognize what what I sort of think is you know nobody's going to come and criticize you and if they do you sort of think well would you do what I've just done I've actually put myself out there to do this and also, I think, um, you know, speak to people who've done workshops and talks and get advice and ask for help and, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's a good idea to do a workshop with another person to share, to, to, to have that, you know, moral support. Mm. Red fears blogging. That's an interesting one, actually, because blogging, um, I haven't got a blog or a website. And the reason is, because everyone's always surprised when I say this, but the reason is because I know that I would not keep it up regularly. I'm rubbish at 
<laughs> you know, I, I start things and then apparently it's a Gemini trait. I, I'm not sure if that's true or not. But what I do and what Rhett, what you could do, Rhett, is I just hijack everybody else's blog. I yeah, just guest, I, guest blog. Yeah, I think of um, something that I would like to blog about or something I don't necessarily think about it. Sometimes you just think, oh, that would make a really good blog post. And then I, I look around for the person who's got the blog where that would be most suitable. And I write to them and I say, I've got a really good idea of a blog post. Will you like, can I do it for you? And I've never been turned down because I'm, most people who've got yeah, blog yeah. are delighted to have some something on your, on your blog post. Yeah, people yeah, are no. dying, dying for content, eh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And you see Phil's comment there that um, you're you're uh, welcome to guest blog for ITDI. Um, our curator is Anna Loseva, and she's always sending out calls uh, for people and looking for new people to blog as well. So that's for any of you who are here tonight or in the um, YouTube audience later on. Is don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us. We have the support at itdi.pro address, and um, you know, we're always looking to expand our community. Yeah, blogging is a great way to reach people and to share ideas and start discussions. I've just written a blog post for the next ITDI blog, and I wrote it. To, it's about materials writing the whole edition, and I've, I've written a day in the life of a materials writer. Yeah. I, I really, I really enjoyed writing it. I really, I, sh I could have sat there and all week and wrote about a week in the life of. <laughs> how, how many cups of tea in the in yeah. day of an uh, ELT writer? <laughs> exactly. I probably lied about the number of cups of teas. <laughs> yeah. Well, anybody else? We're going to wrap up if that's, uh, if anybody else doesn't have, yeah, I think Rhett, Rhett uh, typed earlier, can you start, can you go get like, go get a cup yeah. of tea and start the course yeah. five minutes because he's ready to go. It was yeah. very nice. Rhett said he's taken this course. This will be his third time and he's obviously getting things out of it each time. And that community of teachers sharing ideas under your direction has been, uh, has been one of our best courses. So thank you so much, Catherine, for giving us thank time. You. Yeah. Anybody any, got any more questions? Don't be afraid to ask me a difficult question. I, I might refuse to answer, but you can ask me. I think we covered a lot of stuff in this hour. Yeah. People are gonna, uh, a lot of times we'll have people say, I went back and watched it again. You know, I was in it, but I went back and watched it again over a coffee. Um, here's one, uh, Phil's got one. Uh, if you start, if you start again, new again, what would you do differently? Um, I'm not sure I would do anything differently because I really do think that I learned from each, not, not because I did everything perfectly, quite, quite the opposite, but each time I did something wrong or made, you know, did something in a way that could have been done better, I learned afterwards how you know that that was the impetus if you like for discovering how i could have done it better so you learn from each course but what i would do i think just out of uh, interest my own personal interest in the process of writing i think i would keep a journal i'm always saying this i'm always saying i'm going to keep a journal about with a reflection about my the process of writing on this particular project or whatever. And I haven't done it yet, but I've just agreed to do it for somebody else who is a PhD student. Mm. And she has asked me if I'll, if I will keep a journal, a, a reflection, reflective journal about the process of writing that she can use as part of her research for her PhD. So she's kind of forced me mm. into doing it. So, but I would have done it before because I think I, just as a teacher mm. who keeps the self-reflective journal mm. can learn about their teaching and improve the same, exactly the same is true, I believe, of, of, of 
any profession. Mm. So I've, I've tried that before and failed on the writing side, but I've done much better by speaking because I, I enjoy speaking a lot more than uh, uh, the discipline of writing. So with your iPhone these days, it's very easy to just record your, your yeah. voice. And that I find I can do anywhere. Whereas writing, I have to clear time and space and yeah. sit down and that's hard to do sometimes. I agree, and, and I am actually think I might ask this PhD student if she would be prepared to transcribe <laughs> yeah. recordings from time to time. Yeah, not, but you not, can easily, yeah. Yeah, so. We've got one more question here from Peter, and then let's wrap up. Um, you mentioned in your recent article for Aya Tefel about negotiating principles with publishers. In your experience, how are you able to do that in practice? Um, it very much depends on the publisher, but I've had experiences where I've been told, um, you can't do this. Um, you can't have, uh, you can't, the latest one that I, I didn't like was when I was told that I couldn't have a picture of a little girl riding a bike because the market where the book was going to be sold um, the ministry had actually said, you know, we're not, we can't show girls on bicycles. We can't do this. We can't do that. And there comes a point where you have to decide to yourself, okay, do I, um, ar arguing that point was, was, there was no point in arguing that point. I either have to say yes or no. You know, I couldn't say it, it, basically what would have happened is they would have let me do the work if I accepted, or they would have said, somebody else can do this job, then we can't use you. If you're not prepared to do this, then we will get someone else to do it. So it gets to the point where you have to say, well, am I going to make money? Am I going to make a living? Am I going to accept this job? Or am I going to turn it down because I need, because uh, of this principle that I believe in, but which they are not respecting and they are paying the money and they're the client. Yep. Um, and it's a very, very, uh, it's very difficult. And in writers groups, we talk about this all the time. We get very angry. We let off steam. We share our experiences. Um, you know, it's sometimes it seems so absurd. And yet at the end of the day, what the publisher is saying to us, we agree it's absurd but they will not buy this book if that picture is in it. So, yeah. you know, it's like this. And sometimes I've walked away and said, okay, give it to somebody else. And sometimes I've been in a position where I think, well, I need to do this. I need to put food on the table and pay my bills. So, yeah. Yeah. and then, and there are times, there have been times when I've said to the publisher, please don't put my name on the front cover. I'm not proud of this. Um, and I think a lot of writers, it's not just me that, that says this, other writers have said the same. So um, we just need to, I just think it's important that when this happens, we mention it. We say, we say, okay, I'll do this because you're insisting and I know there's no way around it, but please, for the record, you know, I'd like you to know that I disagree with it. It's totally undemocratic. It's yeah. This, it's that it's against this group or that group or um and then move on but not forget and have a and, and tell people about it because i think this information needs to be um shared you know when we're asked to do things that maybe you know we're not we're not uh happy entirely happy about this is the beauty of <coughs> self-publishing and I know that Dorothy Zemak, my very good friend, and your friend too, Stephen, yeah. she's got an independent publisher, and she is going to be doing an ITDI course on self-publishing. And the beauty of self-publishing means that you can actually create the materials that you want to create without anybody saying, no, you can't have that. Yeah. Um, and I think that for myself on a personal level, that's what I try to do. So where I can't, might not be able to do something with a publisher, um, maybe f materials that I share on a blog post, post or 
sometimes for the British Council um, website, they let me do things that are a little bit more um, controversial uh, than publishers will let you get yeah. away with. But that's a really good question, Peter, yeah. and I'd be really yes. happy to discuss that at length because I, I understand why you've asked the question and um, we feel very strongly about it. Most writers feel very strongly about it. I think Barb summed it up. She wrote, picking your battles. Right? Picking your battles seems to be the step one and, and making your voice heard being maybe step two, um, what, even yeah. when you choose to walk away from a particular battle. Yeah. And if, if you have an opportunity to say how you feel, just so that people are, this, when at, at Ayatethel, when I did my talk, um, I was able, it was a golden opportunity to talk about the things that I didn't think were fair or right or, you know, I'm not going to change things overnight or whatever, yeah. but that, you know, that discussions need to be ongoing, I think. Yeah. Okay, everybody, let's, we're going to wrap up here. And uh, if you want more of uh, time with um, all of us here and with Catherine, we have this course starting up on June 9th and um, more fun for everyone. I want to thank you. Thank you, Phil, for all your work in the background and Barb and, and everybody who's participated. Um, that's another episode of The Teacher's Room with ITDI. And we'll, that, we'll say good night. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn off the recording. Thank you.